I know how I do it at the University of Michigan, um, which is one small part of that culture. Um, I have junior colleagues, I try to lead by example. Why is it that young economists are aggressively beating their chest? It's because they're trying to impress old economists. Um, and so if you want to feel the warm glow of my admiration, that's not the way forward. And so really what we want to do is if more of those people actually speak up and the rest of the world can see, hey, the person I admire acts like this rather than that. And we create a culture where we talk about the problems that we have so that younger economists understand this is problematic behavior rather than okay. I mean, there's formal things we can do. There are codes of conduct. And of course, you know, I've been supportive of that and they exist now. But I think it's quite clear and maybe you've seen some of this in your movie making enterprises that the next generation of economists understands their set of responsibilities and appropriate behavior somewhat differently. Um, the other way, <laughs> let me give you one more suggestion about how we change the culture. Universities change slowly, if at all, and only when they must. So one of the other really important things that's happened is a lot of is simply signing, shining sunlight onto these issues. I've written a number of New York Times columns about this, um, sometimes describing some quite unsavory and very uncomfortable things about the economics profession. Why am I doing that? Truth is, your dean is probably going to read that newspaper. And your dean is probably going to call your department chair tomorrow and say, is this really true that you're allowing this ongoing culture to persist? What's your plan? Um, and so there's a number of people within economics who are taking both internal strategies, what can we do within our existing institutions to improve them, and external, which is let's put pressure on economists to heal themselves, because without that pressure, we may never get around to doing it. In terms of policy, what can we do? I think there's a couple of potential suggestions. One is to make these policies have um, differential benefits for men and women. This is a little bit hard in practice. It's, it's often difficult to uh, quali qualify how much childcare parents are actually providing, um, particularly if, uh, if both parents are, are not employed by a university. Additionally, again, there are some, of, uh, some costs that are only uh, bared by um, birth mothers um, that are, never, are, are not reflected in actual childcare uh, division of labor post-birth. Um, but one potential solution to these policies is to essentially compensate birth mothers for the additional costs of being pregnant, um, going through labor. One potential issue associated with these gender unequal policies is potentially stigma in use. Women, anecdotally at least, report um, being told that it's unadvisable to actually take the tenure clock extension um, because it will be viewed unfavorably or unfairly by their male colleagues uh, or male letter writers um, in the tenure decision. The other potential solution is to target policies towards um, things that can lower the cost of childcare time uh, versus providing blanket benefits. So for example, policies that provide low cost, high quality daycare or childcare on campus may be a good way to reduce the cost of childcare to all parents, regardless of gender, um, in a way that explicitly is tied to childcare time um, and not to uh, a, blanket, um, a blanket policy. Well, I, I think my recommendation is twofold. I, I think the first, I think there is a mechanism that the paper identifies, that there is this role model effect. The first person that they really interact with in the field matters. And so as we think about strategically how we might be able to help 
um, students and other underrepresented groups really feel comfortable within economics, having that first interaction uh, be something that really is valuable to the student and can help the student envision themselves in this career, can help make the rewards more tangible. Absolutely, those are kind of first order things. The second recommendation is, is probably, <laughs> I'm a researcher, so I always feel like we need to understand these things a little bit better. We, we've done very little to kind of systematize or to create opportunities for experimental or quasi-experimental uh, methods to really come in and measure the impact of not just this intervention, but many of the types of interventions that people have proposed. And I wish that we had more rigorous studies that we could really do in the field to see if we can actually increase this representation in other ways. So the first recommendation is just uh, you know reminding ourselves uh, every time before you know we we have uh, interactions that um, are very meaningful in other people's lives like attending a job talk or uh, meeting uh, a graduate students to tell them about uh, you know recommendations for the for the future. We should always remind ourselves of um, the very many you know biases that have been documented. Yeah, so a, no a number of conferences in particular and also just seminar series have um, adopted um, the 10 minute rule, as we call it, which is no interruptions during the first 10 minutes. And that's something maybe specific to economics uh, that in uh, talks <laughs> we give a preview of the whole thing. <laughs> so this 10 minutes is a mini version of the whole thing. But people are impatient and they are eager and they want to understand everything. And so you give a preview, but then they already have all these questions. But obviously, most of these questions will actually become, you know, uh, you know, uh, self-explanatory. You, you'll get the answers to these questions if you just wait a little bit longer. And so, banning questions in the first ten minutes is a way to just get people to realize, okay, I should just be patient. It's, it's almost like treating children and uh, saying, okay, you can't, you can't eat candy like whenever you want to. Uh, once they've realized, okay, yeah, I can, I should actually wait until it's lunchtime. Uh, before I eat something, then it's just like the, the it's kind of like self-control in some sense. So, the first question that pops to mind, if you hold back and say no, I shouldn't be asking, it, I should wait, you know, I think it just sets the tone. And then for the rest of the talk, it may be hard to say if you're an institution and you want to help women in your institution, it may be hard to find them a good match in terms of a senior mentor. So I think departments should try to do that. But one of the interesting findings from our workshop was that people got a lot about being in a group. So it wasn't just the senior mentor or the relationship with the senior mentor. It was that uh, of the people who were in the treatment group, we um, put them into smaller groups according to field. So if you were an experimental economist, for example, you would be with a bunch of other experimental economists. And those kind of horizontal links really helped people. We tend to think about mentorship as being, you know, somebody who's more senior than you, and that's important. But it's also important to help people make horizontal connections and find co-authors, you know, find kind of friends in, in the profession. What we found was that conditional on the organizer being a woman, we would see more women on the, featured on the program um, as authors as well as discussants. Um, and at the NBR, we see like a number of programs uh, now have co-directors who are women and in these leadership positions and in a position to affect change. We see that women tend to give, you know, more, assume more that women gave the more higher contribution, while men assume more that men gave the higher contribution. And in the other experiment, which I haven't talked about, we see that the kind of task matters. So women tend to get, um, let's say, under too, too little credit if it's a task that is stereotypical men. Now, if you put these two together, what is economics? It's a task that stereotypically 
considered men, at least by a lot of people. And it's mainly men making the decisions about hiring and promoting. So, so this that these two effects could explain why in economics there's bias against uh, women in the terms of giving credit to co-authored work, why that exists. Typically now, if you go to universities in hiring, um, at least let's say five years ago, the majority of committees consisted of only men, of hiring committees and promotion committees. Right? Mm -hmm. Only recently, and really only the last few years, have we become very active in, uh, in, in requiring that, that uh, the women are represented in these committees and still a minority. And it's actually a big burden on the female economists that are around because they get asked for everything, right? Uh, because there are not that many. Um, so we're far from, um, from a, a satisfactory uh, equilibrium now, but we're moving in the right direction. And um, you do see that having women in search committees, at least in my department, has been leading to hiring more women. And and we have not been, we've, we've been quite successful hiring women that turn out to be very good. You don't know it until you've done it and tested it. But I predict that having more women, a growing number of women, is going to ease the problem. I mean, also what also helps is making people realize making men up especially in economics because that's where the men, many men are um making them realize about the biases right so so when you look at the cv you know be conscious of the fact that you might be treating this co-authored paper different for a female candidate than for a male candidate but in academics you know having solid empirical evidence in a research paper uh helps you know people tend to 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 to, to uh listen to scientific results if a, a man or a woman would stand up and say, you know, I think we'd, we, we have a bias in the way we're looking at co-authored papers, a lot of people would just shrug their shoulders and, and let it pass. But if there's, you know, if there's serious research with appearance from the field and with uh, experiments to, to, uh, to, to understand the mechanisms, um, more, more people are willing to listen and, and think about better uh, ways to solve this. I think what is interesting is that both settings, so both compulsory and non-compulsory uh, participation in teaching evaluations, led more or less to the same results, that women are um, uh, biased against by, by male students. But I think we have to be careful for if we use these teaching evaluations for comparisons between individuals. So for example, as we would do in a, uh, in a hiring decision or in a decision about whom or which person do we want to nominate for the teaching award. In these situations where we uh, compare different people and possibly men and women, uh, that's very important to, uh, to at least keep in mind that these, might, that these are subjective evaluations of students and as basically all subjective evaluations these might be prone to, um, to gender stereotypes and there we have to be careful. The one uh, sort of alternative strategy which is possibly much more easy to, to, to implement is sort of to inform students before they fill in the teaching evaluations to inform students about um, yeah, about the mere existence of gender bias. So they basically with the intention that students should um, uh, should think about and, and be aware that uh, women are often um, sort of discriminated against uh, in, in evaluations and that they should think sort of before they fill in the teaching evaluation, they, sh they should think, think about the real performance of the, of the person they are evaluating, both for the men and women. I think the easy fix is to, of course, strengthen moderation and maybe have people like review their identities so they wouldn't um, say like really hostile things against one another. But um, that doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't really fix the problems because the uh, good thing about being anonymous is we can see how people, um, what people really believe um, or how they really think about this. Um, efforts that are increasing diversity in different departments, right? Um, so I think the real issue is how do we um, actually get people on board to work together rather than um, just making them like hiding their perspectives so that we never really know what they truly believe. Um, something I would like to see in the future is to um, have more engagement of uh, male classmates and uh, male economists into the efforts that um, 
are aiming for, like promoting diversity um, in the profession. Um, to sort of like, it's not, I think it's good to share the burden <laughs> rather than just letting the women like working on these issues. Mm -hmm.